Hello, hello, everybody. It is 10.39 a.m. Central Time on the 31st of October, 2020. It's Saturday here in the United States. It's Halloween. Uh, some people don't celebrate the holiday, quote-unquote, but hope you're having a good one wherever you're at and hope you're enduring through the craziness of the world. <sighs> Uh, yes, well, we are, at least we're dealing with seismic activity, uh, focusing in like a laser point, like a DEW, I'm focused in on this. Ah, uh, yes, hey, wait till you see my pumpkin carving that I'm doing tonight. Gonna work in a DEW, a beam going right down to where the candle is. That should be good, we'll see if I can get that carved. But we're not here to talk about that stuff, we are here to talk about seismic and of course, yesterday, we had our big earthquake in Europe, or some people debating me on whether or not this is Europe. Well, technically, it's in the Greek Isles, so yeah. Well, it's right there in the Mediterranean, right in South Europe. And again, it's 7.0. They have not brought the earthquake down any, which is somewhat of a surprise. And there was a tsunami that was generated with that, as well as at least 20 large buildings collapsed. As of last night, there were a few hundred people still missing. It was just bad. But I want to bring you up to speed what happened since then. Check this out, guys. Look, 5.6 and a 5.3 earthquake. Add them together, it equals 5.73. 5.7 or well, two separate fives striking right here on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge between Iceland and Svalbard. And if you watched my update yesterday, you knew to watch this area up here towards the North Pole. And I mentioned Iceland, Svalbard. North Pole, and I mentioned upper five to low six activity, or swarms, and what came in was upper five activity. Again, 5.6 plus 5.3 equals 5.73. Now that's just where we're starting. Again, a flow going out all the way up to the North Pole or Arctic Circle. You don't see any other earthquakes out here to the west, and that's because the European feed is only 5050 earthquakes long and it's being filled up by all the aftershocks that are still striking down here at the Turkey-Greece border region in the Aegean Sea. So there have been other earthquakes that struck up in Switzerland, over to the west, over at Gibraltar, at Spain, South Spain. We're watching for that, and then we're watching the UK up here right at the English Channel. And by the way, news today, October 31st, Sean Connery has passed away. Famous actor, James Bond, etc. Highlander. Okay, well, anyway, uh, much love to Sean Connery. And so going back over here to where our deep earthquakes are raised high off the globe, you see them, they're like two sets of antennas sticking up off the planet, but these are deep down into the earth. We're just looking at these easily identifiable raised high off the planet. Deep earthquakes have a shallower, larger earthquake effect. And you'll see in between these deep earthquakes, we have shallower, larger earthquakes, fives connecting in between where our deep fours are. Now, I would expect with this amount of deep earthquake activity that the areas in the middle and the areas on both sides, that would be Indonesia, or actually the areas on all sides, Indonesia, Philippines, and New Zealand, we would see compensation movement that's bigger than what we currently have right now, which is 5 to 5.5, 5.6. Now, I would look in the middle of all of it for the biggest release to take place. That would put us at back into the Solomon Islands, eastern Papua New Guinea. But we have to also watch our open areas. And this open area, for instance, Sumatra, Indonesia, right here. You see we have an earthquake up at Myanmar and a whole cluster of earthquake activity back behind here over to the east. And we look in the middle for the release to take place. That puts us in Sumatra, back to Krakatau, and Java. Going up across Japan, yesterday's earthquake activity, you'll see today, look, it's just quiet. It's quiet across Taiwan, Japan, Kuril Islands, Kamchatka. Yesterday's pinkish colored earthquakes, get those out of there, and again, you see just an open silent zone. We watch to the middle point of this area, the middle point between this 4.6, and the other activity that took place almost 48 hours ago up in North Japan. So that halfway point, if we come up and around the bend, puts us back down into Kyushu, South Japan, Ryuko Islands. I have not checked the Volcanic Ash Advisory Center for today. So let's do that. Hold on. Okay, there we go. 
Got that open. Hopefully you can still hear me. Reventador and Ecuador put off big blasts last week, but today, just small. That's at Ecuador's border. Suanese, Ajima, Saba, and Kaya, and Kopihu. Well, Kopihu is not normally on the list. I just want to see what happened here. Is it an actual blast? Okay, there was a pilot report. No evidence of volcanic ash emission in the satellite data. Webcam shows consistent emission of water vapor. Pilot reported ash cloud. Could be a large steam burst, in which case a pilot might think that that's an ash cloud, but really it's just blast of steam. Okay, so no major new additions to the list, but again, Kopihu is showing some activity. That's all the way down here in South Chile. We also had Nevado State Chilean show activity yesterday, so that's two volcanoes in Chile over here. And they're both pretty much right down here in the middle of our open area in Chile. Okay, just worth remembering that. What else happened? Aussies. Aussies. 3.4 came rolling in down next to Adelaide. Isn't that down by Adelaide? Hold on. I'm, pr yeah, okay. It's 448 kilometers north-northwest of Adelaide. But you know where I'm talking about, southeast Australia. And we go back to the start of this week few days back and we had a new earthquake coming in up here to the northwest prompting me to issue a new warning for all perimeters on Australia and so far one has come in 3.4 I would expect the other areas to move similarly similarly which would put us down to Perth all the way up here in the northeast and possibly in the very far southeast down by Tasmania and the Dutch since underwater logo where my secret base is let me get a sip of my coffee as we triangulate the base back in position for good transmission to my 5G satellites. So, okay, up here to the north, we have fours. And look, all of a sudden, Alaska started to move again. People contacted me last night saying the spectros had gone red. In Alaska, I thought, oh, no. Well, it was a low red, okay? It, was, it wasn't a major huge red, but the location, Sand Point, well, this is right back to where we had our big earthquake, our 7.6 and tsunami that happened about two weeks ago. So in the last two weeks, we've dealt with two tsunamis. Again, two tsunamis in the last two weeks. 7.6 in Alaska with tsunami warning, and of course yesterday's 7.0 in Europe. Both are very large earthquakes, and to get them both within two weeks, it's not like we're dealing with tsunami warnings all the time, guys. It's not like we're even dealing with tsunami warnings every six months. So to get two in two weeks means something. And what does it mean? It means unrest, seismic unrest. Now we know there's seismic unrest taking place because of the deep 6.0 and greater activity that we had. We had a deep 6 and a deep 6.1. So two sets of deep 6s, both here in the West Pacific, and then spreading out from there up to Alaska and over to Europe. We have our 7s. And that's, we're not done yet. Uh, we're still carrying on. We have a bunch of new deep earthquakes hammering off on the underside of the plate. Now, when I say hammering off on the underside of the plate, there's always going to be some new person who doesn't know what I'm talking about. I think down in the magma, down below the plates, a concentric wave is forming on the curvature of the underside of the plates in different points where there's curvature. And the waves that are coming in from all sides, seismic that is, VLF, very low frequency, focusing in on itself in the magma, it could be a physical motion, or it could just be something like, quote-unquote, radio waves almost, that would be hammering in on the underside of the plate. It could be electrical in nature, piezoelectric, but where the deep earthquakes are hammering. We have letter Ds. These are forecast points where we look for new deep earthquakes to strike, and, well, our deep earthquakes are right in the middle of our letter D there, and we go over here and look. There's our other letter D, and, well, there's our other deep earthquake. Up here towards Japan, we have a letter D, and over here towards Afghanistan, where we have another deep earthquake raised high off the globe. So these deep earthquakes are hammering in on the underside of the plate. Then a spread is taking place. And that spread, I think, is a combination of all the waves that combine. And instead of getting jostled around in chaotic waves, they organize and form a standing wave. As the standing wave gains more power, as more hammering action is pumped into this, the waves rise. But they're uniform in a standing wave. And notice each peak is filling in the next valley. I can park my mouse over it and you just watch from one wave to the other filling in each other's middle point. 
So I want you to think of these wave heights or the bottoms, either the tops or the bottoms, as the point where the earthquake occurs. And you get a hammering action. You get the same sized activity within a hair of a point of one another, 4.5, 4.6, 4.4, etc. Spreading out like a wave in a tank. But the tank is not a smooth tank in a laboratory. It's Mother Nature's plate boundaries. So the hammering action is coming up from below the plates. It's coming up through the plates at the break points, which are the plate boundaries, where there's a fracture that starts at the surface and goes all the way down through the plate. It's a weak point for the wave to come up through. Think of this like another analogy we could use is the ocean and waves are smashing against a flood wall or a levee, big old concrete levee along an ocean front somewhere. And the waves are smashing in, but there's a crack in the wall that goes all the way through it from one side to the other, from front to back. And when the waves are hammering in, there's a point where the wave is coming through that little crack or hammering in more on that little crack than it is across the rest of the smoother flood wall. But now, using this analogy in a greater term here, we're talking about the plate boundaries. And the waves that are hammering in are hammering in from underneath, and it's coming up through the plate. When it comes up through the plate, of course, coming out of a fluid and going into a solid, just like a wave smashing against a piece of stone, that impact point is where the greatest amount of force takes place. And that's where we get our earthquakes. And then they spread. The wave spreads across the tank. And again, like I said, I think the tank is the plate boundaries themselves, are the plate boundaries, going over towards Europe and out towards the Azores, out towards Iceland and Svalbard, and going over this way towards the United States. And that's where our earthquakes go. Hence, we're back up in Alaska and we have the same sized activity coming rolling in from the north. Now, again, same sized activity to what? Well, this is a five point something, and the five's going around the rest of the plate right now, the Pacific plate, all the way down to South America, down to, well, we could even go to call that Antarctica, actually. That's the Shetland Islands, but 5.0 down there on the plate boundary. Let me show you the plate boundary down there. See? The red line. And it comes off the Pacific plate, and it borders along the lines of South America, goes over and meets with the Atlantic. And this flowover point, technically, it doesn't belong to the Pacific Plate, it belongs to Antarctica, but nonetheless, the flow goes across the Pacific Plate, down the fracture zone, and out to the very tip to the east by southeast. So getting back to it, hammering action coming in on the underside of the plate, going back up into Alaska, where we flared back up now. But now professionals would call that an aftershock, which I still, I guess I should call it an aftershock too, because it's in the same exact location as our previous large earthquake, off by maybe 10 or 15 miles. But it's a flare back up because we were hammering in at the 3 and 4.0 range up here for the rest of this past week. So it's gone back up by two magnitudes. The aftershocks have received more energy coming in. Now, something else has been announced up here in Alaska this past week. Right out here in the middle of the Aleutian Island chain, we had a big, deep 5.5, which you can see here marked in pink. Right next to the 5.5, they've now announced that a volcano is now in yellow alert mode right next to Mount Atka. So let's go search up in Alaska. Alaska... Volcano, yellow, alert. Okay, and uh, there it is. Coravin Volcano. Coravin Volcano news and activity. Coravin Volcano, Andranoff Islands, Aleutian Islands. Volcanic alert raised to yellow. Alaska Volcano Observatory reported that the alert level for the volcano was raised to yellow as an increase in seismic activity and sulfur dioxide emissions has been recorded. The instruments record volcano tectonic earthquakes over the past two weeks associated with sulfur dioxide, SO2, degassing, detected on the 15th, 20th, and 26th of October. Alaskan Volcano Observatory will continue to monitor the volcano for signs of volcanic activity. Korovin Volcano. Let's just type it in here on Google Earth. Korovin Volcano. There it is. And zooming in on the location, there is the volcano, Korovin. And we'll click on it from the Smithsonian. You can pause it and read it if you need to. We're not going to read it loud, but Atka Island is the location. And remember, look at the shape of Atka. It's got these two long peninsulas on either side with the little center point. Because look, that's where our deep earthquake came in. 
That's where the new activity is. But the deep earthquake came in right next to it. There it is. So hammering in on the underside of the plate up here a few days ago. And up here to the north is the plate boundary, the thick red line. So hammering in here, volcano goes into alert mode here. Then over to the east, we flare back up in the aftershocks. And then a line of earthquakes going up across mainland Alaska. This goes into the northern slopes of Alaska. You can see there's like a line of quakes. This is within three days of activity. But let's just take it down to the last day and a half. It's a lot. There, there's a fair amount of activity. We would call that a frequency increase in the number of earthquakes up here in the last 48 hours. Look how it spreads all the way across Anchorage. Up to the north, past Mount Denali, formerly Mount McKinley, the highest point in North America. And then it goes up to the north, all the way up to the northern slopes. But once we get beyond Mount McKinley, it just drops off in the number. So the frequency is all down here. Again, if this was like drums beating, this would be like a rolling snare drum. Whereas up to the north, not much going on at all. Just a little echo coming off of where this is going on down here on the plate boundary. Let me show you the plate boundary one more time. Here, do you see it? It's the red line, the thick red line. Now there are thinner red lines, which are interior faults, that go along the edge of the Craton, which goes up into northern Alaska. The edge of the Craton, the brownish color, is more interior of the plate. And we'll get into that in a moment because that's where the other earthquakes are striking down to the east by southeast. In the last day, we've got a very rare earthquake over here on the east coast in southeast Quebec. Look at that, 3.6. Now, why does that matter? Well, I just need to take you back a few days and let's get all the smaller earthquakes out of here and let's just look at the threes and greater. Well, there's our 2.9s and greater. Threes and greater. But you can see it a cluster on the west coast and then a four. Well, I mean, it's listed as 3.9, but a four on the edge of the Craton to the southwest down in Texas. Then we get near 4.0 activity or upper three striking over here on the eastern edge of the Craton. Again, going right up through southeast Quebec next to our arrows. Now, I went and looked this location up. I went and looked all these locations up. And I've got some news for some people, guys. A lot of these earthquakes are striking right next to high voltage power lines, the big kind, the kind that are on the huge towers, not the kind that go down your street, because those kind are everywhere, like people tell me. But the high voltage power lines are showing up only in spots where we're having these rare earthquakes, and they're right next to it. There's no debating that. You guys can come in and check it here in Canada, but it's a little hard to see. It's blurry. I have viewers that live in the area that confirm for me that these are high tension power lines, high voltage. Now, you guys don't have to believe me on that because I can show you a dozen other locations across the United States where it's happening all similarly right next to the clear cuts where they have these high voltage power lines. Now, people were asking me how it can happen. Well, I mean, we could get into possible causes, piezoelectric discharge, VLF, a grid playing into it, the human grid, Mother Nature and plasma coming up out of the crust, electric universe, interior of the Earth electricity, exterior of the Earth electricity, radio waves, high frequency, microwave, <laughs> okay, we can, directed energy weapons. There's so many theoreticals on this. All I'm showing you is that the locations are right next to high voltage power lines. We have to figure out how that's happening, and I'm not going to be doing that right now. But I'm just telling you, again, another spot. And then over on the west coast, power generation stations, the geothermal turbines, the wind farms, the hydroelectric dams, and the nuclear power plants even getting hit. Nobody can tell me that they're all over the place. There's like two per state in the United States, maybe. So let's go look at the last day's worth of earthquakes now. Now that we've gotten this rare earthquake on the edge of the Craton up to the east-northeast out of the way, and that follows our four down in Texas, so when we see movement on the Craton down in Texas, I'm not shocked to see new similar sized activity over on the East Coast or up in Southeast Canada, right along the arrows. It's a flow. It's like a river. And we've talked about this so many times, so that's why I'm not shocked by an earthquake up in Canada right there. While other people are like, what? Uh, you know, an earthquake in Canada, oh, no East Coast. Well, it's regular. The flow goes across the plate. We want to see the flow go across the plate. If the flow does not go across the plate, then we've got ourselves a problem where energy builds and we can see a larger earthquake release. Now, I'd like to go over on the west coast. This is 24 hours worth of activity. 
and let's just turn on our 3.0 and greater because you'll see there's two sets of threes. And I can take this down to 2.5 and greater. It doesn't really add that much more in. I just want to show you the threes and greater because look where they struck. So one last night, right here in the middle of Idaho. Let's go pull the coordinates on this. So up in Idaho, oh wait, that's at the Dodecanese Islands over in Greece. Wrong, wrong quake to click on. Wait, I didn't click on any quake over there. Okay, Stanley, Idaho. Now, I already looked this location up previously for power lines. This was this past week. But I'm just going to put the coordinates in and show you what else is there aside from power lines. Here's our earthquake epicenter. And right over here next to it. Now, again, there's roads. There are some low-grade power lines next to it. I know my viewers are looking for that as long as you know, you're checking. Over to the east, our previous swarm location was right here right at the high voltage power lines that were coming into this giant quarry, but the earthquakes were happening like 10 kilometers or 15 kilometers down in the crust. So we know it's not from the quarry. So the electricity may be down in the crust. Now this spot here, this spot in central Idaho, is directly above the deepest part of the center of the magma chamber for Yellowstone over here in Wyoming. The park at Yellowstone, we all know about it. The magma chamber goes down 30 kilometers or more at an angle and down below all of Idaho over to Oregon where it's fed by a feeder for the magma chamber. So the center of the magma chamber is down below Idaho. And look, a line of eruptive points where clearly power has come into the magma chamber before or energy and is pushed up on the magma chamber causing eruptions along the way back over to Yellowstone. Now as I'm talking, look right here. We have hot spots detected as of last night going into this morning. And look, there's about 10 centroids right here on one spot alone detected this morning. What do we have here? Mountain peaks with not much nearby. I don't see anything of any... Wait, hold on. What's this? I said I didn't see anything. Well, there's a road going right through the center of here and some houses... Makes you wonder if there's anything else here at the location. You know, with a road and a house. I don't see anything else of any significance nearby. It's on a mountain peak. Now going down to the south and over to the west, again, we are right on the edge of Yellowstone. Well, over to, I'm sorry, over to the east is Yellowstone. Over to the west is the center of the magma chamber for Yellowstone. This all resides on the edge of the craton. Now hot spots are detected, and these are the red dots here. We could probably see this on actual satellite if we were to go look, which we will go look in a minute. So just remember this spot up here in Idaho, but first let's carry on with the earthquakes. So we're above the magma chamber for Yellowstone. That's confirmed, by the way. You can't dispute that. I have people who try to dispute me on these things, but you guys can go look up the VLF measurements and which way the magma chamber angles down below Idaho. It's really just coming off the edge of the craton. So there's another three. And it's down at the California-Nevada border. So let's pull the coordinates there. The location, Mina, Mina, Nevada. And coordinates, paste, search. This takes us right in where the Monte Cristo Hills volcanic buttes are. This is where a 6.5 earthquake struck about five months ago. Wait, what do we have here? Another right along a road. Okay, again, now that's in the middle of the desert, so you could say that's a little bit more rare. But this surface fractured. And down here, we do have these high voltage power lines again. But again, we're next to a volcanic feature. So I would say volcanic feature, a surface fissure that formed that's 12 miles long on the surface, that crack in the ground basically, that formed when that 6.5 earthquake struck. But which way does the crack in the ground go? Let's look at our smaller earthquakes and get a load of this. Now let me turn down the rings and zoom in on the location. So there's a line of earthquakes here going west to east or southwest to northeast slightly, but it just meets in with the back end of our large arrow. Well, if you follow this back to the west, it goes over to the California border where we have two small quakes. Then it branches down to the south and we have a, like a ring of quakes here across the California-Nevada border. So this points back to this. What's over there at the California-Nevada border? Just go west by southwest super volcano long valley caldera 1000 cubic kilometers of meltdown below 
And in between the two, right here at the border, we have the east side of Mono Lake Volcanic Field with its rising Pahoa Island out of the center. But that's the line of quakes. So a line of quakes or a ring of quakes around the supervolcano, then a line of quakes. Going across Monte Cristo Hills, we only have a little spattering of activity up here to the north. Going from Lake Tahoe in a diagonal line to the east by northeast. Let's go up here to the east by northeast, see what's there. Lovelock, Nevada. Lovelock. Ah, Lovelock. Let's go put the coordinates in. Yes, let's go look. Let's go see what's there. Ah, we're back here at the Salt Flats again, right here at the military training range. But again, it's not a earthquake or it's not an explosion. It's an earthquake. 18 kilometers depth down below this spot. Now, we were here yesterday and I thought, hey, look, we're in the middle of a military training range. They got some kind of little town they built here where they can come in and do the raids. There's also tanks here. Tanks up here on the north side. I'll see if I can find them. They were parked out here in like a little thing where it looked like they were driving around. Yeah, yeah. There's a tank. You can even see the turret off the front. Now, they might be using VLF, very low frequency, directed energy weapons and the like. Could be. Let's go down to the south by southwest. Fernley, Nevada. And again, it's not an explosion. 16 kilometer depth. So we're going out of the military range of some kind. Again, that's military range, but it's way down below. Look where we're going next to. See that? It says geothermal. We have solar farm on one side, which is pretty interesting, but geothermal turbines on the other and pipelines that go out to drill points that go into the volcanic field there. They're doing double clean energy. Sun and geothermal. Soda Lakes is the nearby huge volcanic feature right down the road. So that's definitely related to Soda Lakes. We could carry on. We can go down to the south. So I already explained to you, this is a super volcano on the California side of the border. That's Monte Cristo Hills over on the east side in the Nevada border. Going up here, well, we're at a military range of some kind down below it. Maybe VLF, very low frequency, playing into that. Communication. And then over to the west-southwest, we're at a geothermal. We can keep going down to the west-southwest. This gets us right next to Steamboat Springs. See, it says Dayton, Nevada. Steamboat Springs is another volcano, but this one's been drilled. Let's just prove our case. There's Carson City. Here's our earthquake epicenter, where the little yellow place marks are. And here's Steamboat Springs. Now, Steamboat Springs is the large volcano, and it's an old geothermal field. Or, well, it's not old. It's still active. But old as in it's probably never going to erupt again. But all those turbines there being turned by steam, electrical generation, big time. And our earthquake striking right next to it. Now, I've got to zoom in on the location. Maybe there's a high voltage power line here. We have to check. I mean, if I zoom, oh, there is, look. There really is going across the hilltops here, and it's big. It's big. They even have substations on the lines themselves before they're getting to houses. Maybe that's just... Yeah, that is. That is substation there. Yeah, right there, right next to it. Can't deny it. You'd have to tell me it's chance or coincidence, and it just can't be. Wow, glad I checked. Okay, let's go up here to Northwest California, Oregon and Washington. Wait a second. Oregon and Washington, 24 hours, not one earthquake on land. We have to go all the way up into the Strait of Juan de Fuca, east of Victoria, Vancouver Island, to get one lone quake reported up here. Friday Harbor, Washington is where it's located. Here's the U.S. border with Canada. It's like right there. Here's the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Actually, that's called the Harrow or Harrow Strait. But you know the spot I'm talking about, just north of the Olympic Peninsula, Strait of Juan de Fuca. That's where the quake is. But nothing, nothing across Washington and Oregon. No earthquakes. Wow. Let's go look and see if there are any tremors. I mean, if there's no earthquakes, is there any vibrating of the plate as the plate would be shifting? You know, I said the slow slip looked like it was stopping, right? Or stopped? No. Slow slip did not stop at all. Uh, well, let's put the tremor map on first so we can prove that. 
Here's 180 epicenters as of yesterday. Southwest Washington, Northwest Oregon, Southwest Oregon going into California. Two clusters. But I've got to take you back. Let's go back to like the 26th. See that? It says 41. All right, let's go back to 25th. 230. Now I'm going to bring you forward from the 25th till today. So 25th, 230. 26th, 41. 27th, 379. Why does that? Remember that number, 379. 28th, 64. 29th, 292. 30th, yesterday, 180. Now, what's missing out of there? Well, how about a day where we had zero on the 27th, where it says 379? That was the day where there were zero reported. And I made a video on it. Made a whole video on it, talking about it, how it had gone down from 100 down to 40 or 60 and then down to zero and it looked like it was stopping well, what they did after that was they came back in and populated that zero day with 379 and they did it like a day or two after the fact so like on the 28th or 29th they came in and put 379 of those tremors on the feed that had zero and i even postulated out loud when i made that video that it could be some kind of weird system outage. Well, now we're here on the 30th, yesterday, and there's 180, and we're sticking on the West Coast in between Washington and Oregon, in between Oregon and California, mainly. There's not much tremoring or shifting going on across the state of Oregon. Instead, it's at both perimeters on the border. But the plate is shifting consistent with the Juan de Fuca fracture zone, which is out here on the ocean, and it's like a letter M so out here, each point points into our spots that are shifting. This spot that's shifting on land is parallel to the axial seamount, which erupted in 2015. It's directly across from it. And these spots are shifting. The plate is shifting. The Juan de Fuca is pushing in onto the North American plate, Laurentia, across the quote-unquote Cascadia subduction zone, which people mention to me not mentioning they're like why don't you talk about the cascadia subduction zone much <laughs> ah there's a long story on that okay so no earthquakes across the cascadia subduction zone and same time there's no earthquakes the plate is shaking and shimmying as it's vibrating and moving now on both sides of there we would expect on the north side south side to compensate, actually, all three sides. North side, south side, and east side. And the east side goes over into the edge of the Craton. So over to Idaho, over to Wyoming, over to Montana, over to Colorado, and going over across all the way to the east coast up into Quebec and the east coast of the U.S. So it pushes one way over to the east, obviously, and the other ways it compensates are down to the south, down into California, Nevada, and then back behind it when the shifting and Shaking and shimmying usually ceases. That's when a break happens. So the break hasn't happened yet, at least not on the North American side here to the Northwest. We have to see our big break up here in Alaska two weeks ago. But we would look off the coast of the United States into the Juan de Fuca fracture zone on both sides. The north side goes right up here into the Hecate Strait. The north side of the Juan de Fuca into the Hecate Strait. The south side of the Juan de Fuca goes in with the Gorda Escarpment and makes a bend down into California. Let me show it to you on the USGS map. North side, Hecate Strait. South side, Gorda Escarpment making a bend down into the San Andreas, the thick red line going through California. And that's the way the flow goes, down to the east-southeast through California and east across the Craton. And then back behind it, the breaks take place after the shifting happens. So it's all compensating on all sides of the Juan de Fuca in the United States. And the flow increases when the pressure increases and the transfer increases into the plate. It's pretty basic. You push on the plate, the plate starts to move. And it starts to follow the weak points that are already there. Hence the volcanoes, the drill points, the weak points that have either been mined by humans or punched up underneath by Mother Nature at volcanic spots. So up to the north, for instance. Now, I have to mention this. 
in the last 24 hours, there's been a drop off in the number of earthquakes here in Northern California, particularly at a place called Geysers. And Geysers normally has dozens, if not hundreds of small earthquakes per day. This is a volcano that's been drilled. It's a spot where humans have come in and drilled down to get steam, where Mother Nature is punched up from underneath with the volcanism, obviously. And they're already doing, and they're possibly even doing more in the past couple months, new geothermal turbines here. And these are providing power for the area. And word reached me that they're increasing the load up here. So that just started to happen in the past few months. That might also be playing into why there's new seismic activity there. But this is a volcano. It's been drilled. Geothermal turbines are there. Major electrical generation. And there's like one earthquake there. Maybe two. We normally see dozens or hundreds. Now I've observed in the past, when this drops off here, usually it's a sign of something getting ready to break and push and come in. So it's like the flow to this has been cut off. Which means, if you block a river, the river starts to build up, correct? Behind the block point, behind the dam. Well, the energy would be damming up here right now. From Idaho, back up to the northwest across Washington, and as far south as California. And this whole area is charging, filling with energy right now. And we know that because there's a lot of energy coming in across the rest of the plate. Hence our 7.0 activity over in Europe are 5.0 activity spreading out around the rest of the planet, and no earthquakes reported here in Washington and Oregon. That all points towards something getting ready to break. Now, how big would it go? I think it would be about as big as what's going on around the rest of the planet. So that would put us into the, well, high-end 5, all the way up to 7.0. So high-end 5 puts us 5.7, 5.8, 5.9. Take it up a full magnitude, 6.7, 6.8, 6.9. That's right on the border of 7. That's what's going on around the rest of the planet right now. So I would look between that 5.0 range and that 7.0 range for the new break to happen in the next few days while it's quiet out here. But that's just a projection. It's not a forecast because the slow slip is interfering with the normal flow that we would normally see go across the West Coast. The slow slips don't happen all the time. These episodic tremor slips with these thousands of little red dots, these little tremors, these little vibrations, this only happens every year, year and a half, which means that the rest of the time, the flow is just coming in like normal and going right across the plate. But when the slow slip interferes, the plate starts moving and vibrating and jostling physically. That takes more time to compensate, I think. That's just one possibility on why it takes longer for this to play out. Why does the slow slip interfere with the normal flow? Well, it's in the way moving. I think that's a pretty logical answer. Something's standing in the way of our normal flow and it's blocking it, absorbing it, building it. Maybe like a battery or a capacitor. This is storing the energy and will release it. Now, the flow coming out of it is pretty obvious. It goes down into California. And let me show it to you on the USGS map again here. The flow, the red line, goes down San Andreas all the way down to Southern California where it turns into the Imperial Fault. And the line of earthquakes last night took that path. But look at everything since last night. Here's the last 12 hours. I I'm telling you guys. Either they're under-reporting the earthquakes like they hit the off switch or Mother Nature hit the off switch across all of California too, which now, if you really take it into account, here's 12 hours, here's 24, it's not really that much difference. The color coding on this shows us the older earthquakes. And let me just make sure I've got the right feed turned on. I sure do. 0.0 one day USGS apply. Let's just make sure. Yeah, okay, this is it. So last night we moved, but everything since last night, all of California pretty much gone quiet except for a three right here at Monte Cristo. When I see California go quiet along the coast, when I see the volcanoes up in Northern California go quiet, when I see no earthquakes reported across Washington and Oregon, look, it's like a three state area where we're totally seismically prone and there's no earthquake activity being reported. What would you think? If you're normally prone, 
and you see a bunch of small earthquakes all the time dozens of them and then you go a full 12 hours and there's not one not one 0.0, .0 and greater it makes you wonder what's building or if the system's out you know if they're having a system-wide outage for some reason it could happen it would be rare but it could happen you know they didn't cover the tsunami yesterday over in Europe either something's up with the USGS their directors being asked to step down over retaliation against whistleblowers we don't know what the whistleblower was blowing the whistle on but whatever they were blowing the whistle on the director of the USGS called them evil and called the other whistleblowers evil and tried to reassign them and did reassign them to other locations or whatever I don't know that's the story and that's pretty weird in light of no earthquakes getting reported and missing a tsunami yesterday I mean you should read the comments down below my videos from yesterday guys look I've got people who normally dog me a lot and I mean I get dogged a lot on Facebook even some of those people came over and said well looks like you got it right this time but a stop clock's right, right twice a day I even laughed at that I said ah oh, stop clock right twice a day oh God bless you have a good one have a good Halloween <laughs> but it, I mean you know what it is I, I have to show you the, the tsunami and of course I was even incredulous I'm I'm just like what is this how do we not have the professionals showing us a tsunami over in Europe of all places and then people are like well that's not Europe dude that's not Europe it, it it's right at the border of Turkey it, it's that's the Mediterranean I'm like ah oh. yeah all right so no earthquakes across the coast of California in the last 12 hours quiet 24 not much more to add into it one lone quake down here on the creeping section of the San Andreas and it's at San Ardo which I think is closer to Parkfield than it is to Pinnacles but let's just go put it in and show you if you know your area in here you'll know what I'm talking about with Pinnacles and Parkfield if you're new let me show you a picture speaks a thousand words here's the earthquake epicenter here is the San Andreas and look what we have starting right next to this right down at the bottom of the valley so here we are we're at the San Andreas we come right over here and boom all of these oil and gas oil and gas lots of oil Jed clamp it out here but no for real look how many there are there's just thousands of them and they go on all the way down to the east or west southwest and east southeast two directions around here and every one of these is a different oil well mainly oil there is natural gas in there but it goes down to the south and picks up in earnest but this is the San Andreas so the earthquakes come down to the spot where the drill points start and then the earthquakes pick up down where the drill points kind of putter out into the Mojave Desert down here to the south let me show you so we jump across the valley Tehachapi California so we're going from the San Andreas and the earthquakes just come right down to where the drill points are and then down here to the east southeast the earthquakes pick back up right here and guess what's right here at the foot of the mountains you guessed it another oil field and it's big just like all the others and this one goes through the farm fields and goes across over into the desert and it goes into something that I call just gangbusters overdrive drill points just look how many there are and it goes on and on and on and on and on it goes up to the north to halfway house where there's more all over the place and they're all connected with pipelines so let's recap one earthquake up here on the San Andreas right next to where the oil wells are where they drilled out and start in earnest then going down to where the drill points stop in earnest there's still some more down to the south but where they putter out down here at the south tip of the valley that's where the earthquakes go to it's like a diagonal line going from up here to down here and the USGS announced in a conference last year where there was a, a woman who did a bunch of research out here she did years worth of research and published it all they did a whole conference where she did Q&A from the USGS it's on their YouTube channel where they talked about severe subsidence across the Southern California Valley and severe subsidence when they use the word severe USGS that's a big deal the whole area has sank sunken from here down to here and back around by up to 40 feet not like a pocket like a sinkhole 
The whole area, including the roads, the houses, the bridges, everything, all collectively sank in unison. So something's draining out of the area, and they try to blame groundwater. Well, up here, going down from Kettleman City, where she announced, down to Bakersfield, down here, where this giant oil field is. Here's Bakersfield, and up here is Kettleman City, right here. So a diagonal line is subsiding from here down to here and all the way back around. And look what there is down here. Hundreds of thousands of oil wells. All of these are oil wells. And they go along the San Andreas. Here's the San Andreas. And right up to the San Andreas. Just a matter of a couple miles. All of these oil and gas wells. So they drilled the San Andreas. And guess what's happening? The energy is going off the San Andreas over to the perforation points. It's just so basic. That's what's going on. Anybody who's worked with stone understands what I'm talking about here. But this is multi-layer now. This is layers upon layers, miles upon miles, but the same principle applies. Perforation and scoring, and then applying force or power to that slab of rock. Or, well, you can do this on any substance. So going down across California, we already talked about the super volcanoes. We already talked about the lines of earthquakes going up across into Nevada. What about down in the Mojave Desert out here? One lone quake in the Mojave at Ludlow. Ludlow. Let's go look. Because I do recall there being something here in the middle of the desert. Two things here in the middle of the desert. Or three. Three things here in the middle of the desert, which is kind of weird. To have three things in the middle of nowhere, right? So here's the earthquake swarm outbreak. We have these high voltage power lines quite literally going through the desert at this point. And these are the big tower kind, not the little phone pole kind. Now next to them, look, there's the big towers, huge. And then next to them, they have smaller towers, but they're still the towers. They're not the little phone poles not down your street. And across the highway, Pisgah Crater Volcano. And at Pisgah Crater Volcano, we have a gold mine. So we have a mine, a volcano, and a set of power lines, all three at the location, and a volcanic field if you want to take that into consideration too. Now I had a relative contact me from out here in California asking about the directed energy weapon beams. Have we heard anything more about it? What's happened? The fires in California seem to have died out all of a sudden. Uh, things are still dry out there, you know. Yes, you did get a little rain, but why did the fires suddenly stop? Or why did the ones down in Southern California suddenly start? Did you catch any beams recently? And, well, ever since they started shutting off the satellites at night. Because of a technical overheating issue, it's been a little difficult to see the directed energy weapon beam out here on the West Coast since they are literally cutting the satellite feed at night now. And they're still doing it. They said they were doing it. Now, they might have stopped in the last day or two or something. They said they were doing it to, for, at the Equinox. Well, hold on. The Equinox... <laughs> the Equinox has come and gone, guys. So, why are they still censoring the feed? I guess the sun's still shining on the satellite, causing an overheating issue. Oh, uh, hey, boo-boo. We're having an overheating issue. A dirk a dirk a dirk. Yes, that's the explanation. And don't ask any questions. Let's go down here to the east southeast. So we're not going to get any directed energy weapon beams. They're totally cutting the feed and censoring it. Ever since Trump responded to me directly on the Tyndall Air Force Base, and ever since Defense Secretary Mark Esper responded to me directly on directed energy weapons, it's been a little weird. Things are getting a little weird here in the Dutch sense world, which is already a little weird. All right, let's go put the coordinates in. Go into L.A. Basin. Where are we going? Let's get out of this place. Somebody get me out of here. Whoa. Hey, look, we have an earthquake right next to a quarry. Let's go see. Is this a quarry blast? No, no, no. It's Grenada Hills. Grenada Hills. 7.8 kilometer depth. Oh, it's not related to the quarry, is it? I wonder if it's related to this. This gas storage operation. Fracking oil and gas storage right at a place that you may have heard of before. It's called Aliso Canyon. You ever hear of Aliso Canyon out here in California, guys? How about about two years ago? There was a big blast up here, and the gas came out, 
and float out all across the entire area. I believe that's a Lisso Canyon, isn't it? Hold on, hold on. Let's just let's verify. Acquiring minds want to know, and I just got to make sure I'm right before I tell you it's a Lisso Canyon. Yeah, 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 it's a, a Lisso Canyon or oil, oil field. This thing blew. And the gas came out and hundreds of thousands of people had to evacuate. All kinds of people got sick. They got nosebleeds, instant nosebleeds as soon as they inhaled this toxic gas. Because it wasn't just methane. It was like a mixture of nasties. But here, right across the whole range, they got a quarry there. But on both sides, we've got fracking, oil and gas. I'll zoom in and show you. So here's some tanks. Tanks, pumps, jacks, pipelines. And there's a truck. Oh, look at the, wow, look at those power lines there. Jeez, dang. I wonder we have a bunch of earthquakes there. Anyway, we've got ourselves a earthquake at the Aliso Canyon gas storage location right next to it. Professionals said there was no relation between the earthquakes and the Aliso Canyon location. That was like two years ago, or no, three years ago. Whenever the blast happened out there, they were denying that there was a relation between the earthquakes and the pumping operations there. Then it blew. The professionals just shut up after that about it. Which is good. I'd rather have them just shut up than say it's not related. I mean, that's just foolish. So here we are. Wait, is this a quarry blast? This is at 12.7 kilometer depth. But it's also next to another quarry. Now wait a second. How could we have all these quarries and have an earthquake right next to the quarry without there being a blast? What are they doing there? I'm just curious. What is this place? Yeah. Is that a landfill? Is this some kind of landfill or is that a quarry? Might be a landfill. If it's a landfill, then we could have methane on this, which could explain a lot. Almost does look like a landfill. Let's turn on our gallery. Some kind of trash mound or something. Is it? It might be. Yeah, it is. Guys, it is. This is a giant mound of trash, it looks like. I mean, I'd be surprised if it's not. I could be wrong, but it's not a quarry. Look, they've mounted this up, and they've got the excavator equipment on top. It's not labeled as a landfill, though, for trash. Like, normally there's a place mark on these things. All right. Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting sidetracked, but... It does matter to me because that's a, a methane production point. We all know about it. They Even at landfills, they have these pipes that come up out of the ground and they burn off the methane. All right. Just taking my time to look. I want to see if there's anything else there. Going down to the east by southeast from there, we have a 0 0.9. Home gardens. Wait, now this is listed as a quarry blast. What the heck? And this is at right at the surface. So let's go look at this quarry. Man, life is so weird. We're going down next to a quarry now. And the others are right next to quarries. They're not listed as quarry. Oh, wait, we're not going into a quarry. This one does not go directly into quarry. There's a quarry next to it. Oh, my goodness. Okay, it's so weird. But I'd like to show you something else that's here nearby. So let's take this quarry blast as an example and put on the tectonic plates in U.S. Falls. We can follow this thin red line back up to the north through West Covina. Back up to the north through Santa Clarita, and it brings us right back up here to Fraser Park. Just remember that, because look at our earthquakes. They go back up across and meet up at Fraser Park, right here. So there's an open area in between where the earthquakes are coming down through the L.A. Basin, and that's going across here. Well, hold on, look at this. That's the thick red line of the San Andreas. Now, right in the middle is where all the fires broke out. So we had the lake fire here. I don't know if that's what it was called, but right here we had a huge fire next to this lake. And we had huge fires that broke out across the San Andreas going all the way down to Yucaipa. As we go further to the east-southeast, we have two lines of quakes mainly on the western side of Salton Sea. And one line of quakes going over on the eastern side of Salton Sea. Now the two lines are a little bunched together. Let me show them to you on the USGS map here. One line of quakes coming down the San Jacinto, the other coming down the Elsinore, both meeting back up in the South Salton Sea. The third line going across the east side of Salton Sea, that's the San Andreas itself. 
Now we had hotspots right here where the earthquakes are. Hotspot there, hotspot there. We also had hotspots right here and here. So four locations with hotspots now have earthquakes. And that's something we were keeping track of last week. Let's go down and look, see if there's any there today. Hotspots right up here. They're not there now, so something to keep watch on the hotspots is where are they appearing? Well, they're appearing next to our volcanic locations, next to our well-known faults, and on our plate boundaries, craton edges. Oh, I would like to point out, and we should go look this up at this point, the hotspots in the Midwest. So what happened? What happened to all the hotspots? They suddenly stopped. With the seismic activity going over to the East Coast, all of a sudden, every farmer stopped burning their field. That's what it is. Ah, oh, yeah, 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 that's the ticket. Every farmer stopped burning their field, Dutch. Okay, if you guys say so. So let's just go and uh, take a look at our shortwave infrared. Is it still going on? Or is it still quiet? Because it's clear here today, guys. It was clear here yesterday until the afternoon. Yesterday afternoon, it started to clear out. Yeah, to 200 images, shortwave IR. Not a single field burning across the whole Midwest. I guess all the farmers are done. That must be it. All the farmers are done. Yep, they all got it burned. Oh wait, why was it just in the New Madrid seismic zone? That's even weirder, wouldn't you say? Or maybe they, maybe all the farmers in the country bring all their burnable crops, like all the shavings of everything that whatever, and they bring it all to the New Madrid seismic zone and dump it on the and burn it and flush it down the river. Maybe that's what they do. That's it. Yeah, that's how they're doing it. The whole country brings all its stuff here to the Midwest and burns it all in the middle of the New Madrid seismic zone as part of some fall ritual. Let's go down into Louisiana where we just had the hurricane come in. I noticed yesterday Louisiana was having a bunch of oil wells flare off across the bayou in the south. And uh, that, that's not them burning trash either. So there's nothing there today so far. Oh, wait. Did I say there's nothing? There's like one appearing right here in the middle of the Mississippi River Valley. So, no hotspots. Pretty odd, wouldn't you say? But now, while there were no hotspots on the New Madrid seismic zone, we have hotspots appearing up the eastern edge of the North American Craton and the western edge of the North American Craton going up into Canada. And we can see the hotspots listed on the hotspot map here from the GOES satellite imagery. And they're marked in orange from yesterday. Going across Idaho, back up into Canada, and our fire detection centroids stop right about here where the red line is. But they go down across, following the Craton Edge, and skipping over the New Madrid seismic zone, focusing in on the coasts. And we get down here into, ooh, South Florida also seeing something happen down across the uh, south tips of Florida. And I went and looked these up. It's nothing but swamp. Swamp gas. That's what it is. Yeah, that's the ticket. Swamp gas. And now that's actually, it's possible. It could be swamp gas. Methane squeezed out from the edge of the plate. But look, we're down here in the Florida Keys. There are no roads. There are no power lines. We have names associated with these little, I would call them keys, but they call them hammocks apparently. I didn't know that. Little tree-like areas that you can go to in the middle of a swamp. But there it is. I mean, there's nothing there. There's literally nothing there. We have to go all the way over here to get a road. And maybe along the road, there might be some power lines that they're... Again, they're small, though. They're not the big tower kind. So looking at it that way, we're in the south Everglades. We're in the central Everglades. We go up here to the north, and then we're in some fields, but we're surrounding Lake Ochikobi, which is this giant lake... And there has to be huge methane deposits all the way down and around here. Think of a bog. That's what it is, bog. So we have hot spots appearing there right now as I'm talking. Let's go down and take a look. Let's go see what's going on. Uh, let's get a localized sector in South Florida. There's Lake Okechobee, and we just need to look around it to see because... Oh, yeah. Whoa, look at that. Hold on. Right like we have four at once in the same five minute time period. These go for five minutes and they're off. Each one's a five minute panel here. So the frame is reshooting a new picture every five minutes. It's 
So there, there, and there, all three sides of Ochakobi. Then they go out within 10 minutes. And then, boom, another one. And then it goes out within five minutes. And then two more. There and there. And it's raining there. It is rain. It looks like it's starting to rain there. Let's go and look on natural color fire view and see. Yeah, it's we've got major thunderstorm kicking up down there. Let's go down and look at the composite radar. Yeah, yeah, you can see the red is... This is thunderstorm activity here now, guys. So we're not seeing lightning striking, by the way. These are five minutes going on for five or ten minutes. and Yeah, that, that's the radar image of it now. So we've got stormage there. But this has been going on for a few days at this point. So tattoo noticing around this and going down through the Everglades. And there is just one explanation for the Everglades. That would be methane. So it's focusing in on the south tip of the whole North American plate. Look at it this way. Here's the North American plate Laurentia. Comes down and goes down. Our plate boundary is right down here through the Caribbean. And this is the fold. These are the folds in the plate. This is the continental shelf. Here's the North American craton. It's the very southeast tip, if you will. So that is really, really darn interesting, wouldn't you say? Now, anywhere else? We have the power... Oh, look, we have a hot spot up here in the far east, northeast, all of a sudden. This is going into Massachusetts. Ah, go park your car at the car park. Yeah. Yeah, up here in the northeast. Okay, what's... Where are we? We're at Williamstown. Never heard of it. North Adams. Sorry, people in Williamstown. Whoa, what? Whoop, whoop, whoop. Dirt, dirt. Look what we got. Right here, going right across through town. We've got these high tension, high voltage power lines. The big kind. Anything else here nearby? It's literally the, one of the only spots where it's coming in. They have to go another county to the south right through here which we can zooming in on the spots there you can see it so okay again another spot but this is on the edge of the craton too so i'll say that it could be both i mean the electrical power lines might just be aiding in the craton moving we're also just one county away from the next rad radar you know i'd wonder if there's anything showing up on radar you got a hot spot right next to it so it's on the edge of the craton, a hotspot at a power line. And it looks like they're going right in a line down across the craton, back over across into Louisiana, back over to Texas, in a line down through the south. Again, north of there, we don't have anything. South of there and right along the edge of the craton, going down through Texas, we've got ourselves hotspots again. So these hotspots are geological, geophysical phenomenon, I think. Whether it's related to the power lines or not, it's just a geophysical phenomenon that we've related to the power lines. Now, the earthquake striking there lend credence to there being some relation. And that takes me back to where I started this whole update for the West Coast, which is the plate is shifting. We are seeing a spread go across the plate, whether it's to the East Coast all the way over to Eastern United States or over to Quebec. It flows across the Creton Edge. We've been cut off. The flow has been shut down coming in from the northwest right now. The plate is still shifting, hundreds of tremors per day. But no flow coming out of any significant size means something's building and going to flow out. And it's just like the flow of a river that you dam up or block off. That's going to flow out and down and away from where you're damming it up when you let it free. And it's going to break free. Mother Nature will break it free with a new push coming around the plate. Let's go turn on our seven-day feed again. That takes me back to the sevens that have been striking around the rest of the planet. Seven striking across the rest of the planet. Two in two weeks. Two tsunamis in two weeks' time. Can't ignore that. Anybody who ignores that and tries to say that happened? Yeah, yeah. You're just being an ignorant person. You're just ignoring something in purpose. You're ignoring the earthquakes out of convenience or something. You don't want to cause panic. You don't want to worry about it. Okay. But two sevens and two tsunamis in two weeks' time, that's an increase. What can you do? You can have an earthquake plan. You can watch the arrows. You can pay attention to when I issue a forecast. I don't really have any new forecast going right now. We're waiting for the West Coast to move. We're waiting for the activity to spread out across the plate. I'll probably do a new forecast by 
Monday or Tuesday of this week, people were asking me, did I warn Greece? Yes, we warned Greece. We warned Greece and Turkey. So we warned the Isle of Cyprus starting on about October 16th, maybe a few days before that, the 13th. 13th to the 16th is when I started warning Cyprus. And we carried on the warning an extended period of time, two weeks. And I said on the 20th, which was 10 days ago basically, on the 20th of October in my update, I brought up Cyprus and how we're still watching it for a larger earthquake above 5.5. And so you go back and listen to my updates if you need to. Again, October 16th, October 20th, my updates, I directly mention Cyprus, directly mention Turkey, and watching for something above 5.5. And then here we are, a 1.5 magnitude larger earthquake comes rolling in, a 7. Again, if I'm looking for 5.5 or greater, and a 7 comes into the spot right next to it, that's the earthquake. It struck, now people are saying, ah, it struck Greece. Guys, that's right at the shores of Turkey. It doesn't matter whether it struck in Greece or Turkey. They're right there at the border. The point is, is that the region that we're looking for got hit on the edge of it, right next to Cyprus, within a week and a half to two weeks of issuing the warning for an extremely large earthquake to strike there that would get everybody's attention. Well, there it is. It got everybody's attention. It is 380 miles from the center of Cyprus. Now, I look 200 miles in each direction. So what, what is it, 180 miles off from the 200-mile area? Come on. On something that everybody said was impossible, by the way. All right, that takes me back to you guys now. Do you have an earthquake plan? It's not impossible for you to develop an emergency kit. Put an emergency kit together. has a change of clothes, set of shoes, flashlight, batteries, first aid, sanitation. Have all those things. Uh, extra ID, uh, extra insurance cards if you have anything worth insuring. If you have extra cash, most people don't. But if you do, you could put extra cash in there or an extra debit card. But it's a good idea to have that stuff and have it into a bag. So that way you're not fumbling around at the last second and you only get a few minutes or less to get out of a house. You know, a few minutes for a flood or a fire. A few seconds for an earthquake or severe weather. Severe weather that you don't know about. But severe weather, flood, fire, earthquake, you can at least have the basics met so you can grab that bag. And whether you're going outside or sheltering inside, you're not fully left without anything. Now, the food and water is just going to get you through a couple days in the backpack. So it's not going to be like long-term supply food and water in your backpack. So you have to have the long-term stuff taken care of as well that you can get to. But I'm just talking about that bag that you're going to grab and go outside. You might be outside for a little while. You might not be coming back in for a minute. If it's cold outside, you need to have that taken care of. Think about your family. Think about, of course, the kids, if you've got any kids, relatives, elderly, disabled, you guys should have the medicines that you need, a little bit of extra of that if you need any medicines. And you guys will come up with good ideas, way better than what I'm suggesting, to put into your emergency kits. Okay, let me remind everyone. Subscribe. Subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe. If you're watching on Twitch, please subscribe. Everybody, thank you for supporting my operation. You have made a big difference in getting the word out. I'm 100% certain lives have been saved over these years. Certainly in the last several years since I've been live streaming, we've gotten thanked by people in these areas, even on the nightly news. By the way, speaking of nightly news over in Europe, I want to thank Janet. Uh, Janet Fuller Love, who lives over here in Italy. Uh, she's the one who gave me the shout out on the BBC. Now, I've got a new warning going for this week for Central Italy, right where she's at or right around it. And where we're looking for upper four to low five, maybe even bigger. 4.9, 5.0, but it could go up into the low 6 level. So 5-ish into 6. I'm leaning towards 5. Did I say upper 4? Not for Italy. 5-ish or greater going into the low 6 level for central Italy. Same with over in Bosnia. Same with over in Romania. All should be getting in that 5 into low 6 level. I hope I'm wrong, but central Italy, it's the last thing you guys need. So I have to warn you now. Because again, this is right here imminent. It's on your doorstep. The plate boundary is right there. I just need you guys to pay attention and watch for this, okay? Because I'm warning you now, I hope it doesn't hit. If it does not hit, I will get back on and beat myself up. Like I always do if I get it wrong. And if I get it right, I'll get back on and briefly tell you about it. And people will call that self-congratulating. But I don't care what people call it. Everybody's got something to call everything. How about this? We call you prepared 
for having an earthquake plan and you pay attention to where the earthquakes are striking. Use the arrows on the map here, which took years of observation to come to. So the arrows, people ask me, how did you do this? Well, observation. Watching which way a flow happens over the course of weeks, months, and years. So it took years to observe which way the flow happens. Now, it happens on a weekly basis, 7 to 10 days. So it's not like it takes a long time for the flow to go out around the planet. But you need many years of examples to go on to get a path or a trajectory on these. And that's what the arrows are for. If anything changes, I will be addressing that. And you guys will see you back here later on, most likely this afternoon or evening as some of the earthquakes start to strike in the areas where we're watching. The threat does exist for large earthquake activity to come in on the west coast of the United States, especially with it going quiet like it has. How big? As big as the rest of the planet right now, so that's in the upper 5, low 6 range, going to 7. That's pretty narrowed out right there, actually. We've kind of winnowed it down to a 1 to 2 magnitude range, which is pretty good. If anything changes, like I said, I'll jump back on at a moment's notice. You guys, be safe. Oh, and look out for this as a video to premiere over on YouTube. Much love, guys. And much love to Sean Connery again. You know, I, I'm i not going to be able to do a Sean Connery impersonation for a while. Wouldn't even try. I'm not going to disrespect him like that. The guy's cool. Peace out.